ladies and gentlemen, please welcome author James Andrew Miller and moderator David Davis. Welcome. Anybody want to come closer? Want to? <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you for coming. I want to also, to begin, just want to say thank you to the organizers who've been great. Um, and I, this is my show and tell. This is J Jim's book, just in case you haven't seen it and see how thick it is. Unbelievable work. Uh, few. Yeah. 550 different people interviewed for this book. It's an oral history. Highly, highly recommend it. We're just going to touch on a few subjects, but this is well worth your investment. And if you have any interest in sports, if you have any interest in television, if you have any interest in the entertainment world, uh, this will help you as a guide, as a reference. So anyway. Well, I think we should end it right there because <laughs> it's not going to get better for me than that. <laughs> Um, first off, just the, the title of this is The Future of ESPN, but certainly past its prologue, and I want to sort of maybe set the stage. How did we get here to 2018, worldwide leader in sports and all that? You've probably heard da-da-da, da-da-da, more than anybody outside Bristol. Um, how did this scrappy little underdog from 1979 get to where we are now? Well, I, um, is this working? Can everybody hear me? Yeah. So um, that's actually my favorite part about talking about ESPN. Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with it, but I'm just going to give you like a one-minute history, which is this guy named Bill Rasmussen was working in Hartford, Connecticut, and he gets fired on a Friday afternoon. Um, he was working for Gordy Howe, the, uh, the hockey great, and he's unemployed, and he hooks up with a friend who was working for Aetna Insurance. So there's n n nothing's making sense so far, right? And uh, they were going to uh, do balloon rides and Connecticut basketball at local cable stations. So their, their goal was to like tape a local basketball game, put it on a bicycle or in cars, and take it to all these little mom and pop cable stores, cable stations around Connecticut. This is 1978. And then he met this guy named Al Paranello, who, by the way, is still alive and one of the most interesting guys. He's working for RCA. And his job is to sell something called a transponder on the first satellite that RCA has going around the world, going around the Earth. And at the time, there were seven transponders on it, and they only sold three of them, one to HBO, one to Ted Turner for Atlanta Braves, and another one. And they were just talking, and he goes, you know, I think this is the future. And uh, so somehow Bill and his son, Bill Rasmussen and his son, they said, uh, well, do you have any more? And he goes, well, we have one, but we just took it off the market because nobody wanted it. He said, what was that? He said, well, it's a 24-7 it's a transponder. Because remember the old days? Did you guys remember? It, HBO used to go off at midnight. Remember, you couldn't watch movies during the night. They go, well, this... This one, 24-7, nobody wanted that. And Bill goes, well, we'll take that. Let, let, we'll take that. And they had no idea how to pay for it. He just said yes. He committed to it on a Thursday. That next week, I believe, the Wall Street Journal did a big story about these transponders and RCA, and the whole world wanted one. Meanwhile, Bill's sitting there with it. And fast forward to 20 years later, ESPN is bringing in $12 billion of revenue to parent company Disney. It is literally the greatest media success story of all time. When Disney bought Pixar, they were using ESPN money. They were using money that ESPN had made for, for Disney. It makes more than the amusement parks, the movies, everything else. And my mother, who, God bless her, has this cable TV, right? Every single month, $7.50 of her cable bill <laughs> is for ESPN. She's never turned it on. <laughs> she never turned it on. So a couple of years ago, they had 100 million homes paying $7.50 a month. So you have 
NBC, I'm sorry, I'm just going to no, no. real quick wrap this up for a second. No. I'll tell you how you, you get to be successful. You have NBC, ABC, and CBS over here. They're selling advertising time. You have ESPN over here. Oh, they're selling advertising time too. But PS, they're getting $7.50 a month from $100 million homes. Who's going to win that? So I don't know if any of you remember ABC Wild World of Sports. It's gone. It is no more. ESPN, the mouse ate the lion. And uh, I mean, it's still, despite its issues, phenomenally successful. Right. So that in two minutes is the history of ESPN. Right, and we'll, we'll go into some of the challenges facing the future, but y you mentioned, um, what, about 100 million subscribers, and yet within the last 10 years or so, the last decade, things are starting to creep down in that. So the last four years, they've lost about 13 million homes. And I felt like such a dinosaur because I was moving my son in to his new apartment after he graduated from college. And I said, uh, do we have to wait for the cable guy you know, to come and install? He looks at me and goes, Dad, what are you talking about? I go, well, the cable guy, you know? I bought you a TV. He goes, well, I'm not getting cable. I'm not going to spend $200 a month. He's got Apple TV, and he streams everything for free. So that's why there's been layoffs at ESPN. That's why the tremendous growth is no longer like this. And there are some other reasons as well. And certainly one of the things I want to talk about in terms of getting to the present about ESPN, um, for so long they were that mouse, that, and not Disney mouse, but <coughs> just the mouse, underdog, scrappy. They're in Bristol, Connecticut. They're not throwing big big parties Hollywood style. Um, but there was a, a cult that grew uh, among sports fans who couldn't get enough of this. They had personalities that people clung to. Was that something that they worked on? Was that something organic that led to the success of ESPN? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I thought about it a lot and uh, write about it in the book. So I think the answer starts with that word Bristol. Bristol, Connecticut, you know it well, uh, is in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> and that wound up being the greatest news of all for ESPN. Two things happened. One is, throughout ESPN's history, first Getty Oil owned it, then ABC had a place of it, then Capital Cities, all these different companies. Nobody ever wanted to go to Bristol. And so what that means is they were kind of left on their own to do what they wanted to do. Also, the other thing that happened is, if you go to work at ESPN, you're not working in New York City where, like if you're working at CBS, right, in New York City, NBC wants you, but you just go across the street, so to speak, right? If you're working at ESPN, you move to Connecticut, and you put your kids in school, and you buy a house. And so all of a sudden, when somebody wants to take you away, steal you away, you go, well, I'm already kind of here. So as a result, people don't date ESPN. They marry it. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> there is, you go through the halls there, and you just, oh, this one's been there since 1979. This one's been there through 80s. And everybody stays, which is one of the reasons why when they had the layoffs, because they laid off 300 people a couple of months, a couple of years ago, and this year, this past year, they laid off another 100. It's tumultuous because everybody's, they're all standing at the bus together in the morning before they go off to work. They all know each other. They're not just anonymous colleagues that, you know, are lost in the naked city of New York City. They're like neighbors. So what it does is it, it bonds the culture in a, in a much more fundamental way. And I think that, to your point, there, there becomes like this whole different kind of environment where they're changing rules all the time. There, you know, there's a, there's a guy, I wish he was here because he's so interesting. There's a guy named Bill Fitz, and he was one of the early producers at ESPN. And you know what he, they used to do when, um, Bill used to do when they covered an annual event? He used to go and take all his notes for the production. At, at another network, they put him in the file, right, for next year. So you know how to do it? He would take it, and he would burn all the notes in front of everybody. Because next year, we're not going to be bothered by how we did it this year. 
next year, we're going to come up with all new ideas. We're going to pretend we've never done this before. And like, how is that for like creativity and great, you know, just leadership in terms of how to do things differently? And that's part of what was, um, that was part of VSPN, particularly early on. And certainly one of the other um, sort of bellwether innovations, a as it were, um, was Sports Center, which uh, most of you probably know, Sports Center being sort of that nightly news recap with the highlights, et cetera. And it, and it used to be squeezed into the halftime at a you know, Monday night football game. Um, and it became, I guess, one of their one of their lead, uh, one of ESPN's lead. How did, how did SportsCenter grow and mature and become what it is today, well, maybe what it is a few years ago, which is the nightly source that you had to, if you were in the sports industry, tune into and, 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 and watch? Well, remember, before SportsCenter, even if you, uh, you watched your local news, it was four minutes. Remember, the guys would talk so fast. And I do mean guys because there were very few women doing it. They would do so fast. When ESPN went on the air, September 7th, 1979, Sports Center was on the first night, and it's been on ever since. And it was 30 minutes. And everybody goes, what are you talking about? Walter Cronkite's 30 minutes. <laughs> like, how are you going to fill, fill 30 minutes of sports? It turns out you can. And sports fans loved it because – not only did you get to see the scores, but remember back in 1979, how are you going to see highlights? You know, how are, like if you, if you lived in Arizona, but you had moved there from Boston and you're still a Red Sox fan, you get to see Red Sox highlights. You get to see all the different sports. There's no way local sports covered all that. So as a result, it became a phenomenon. And then in the 1990s, people like Keith Overman and Dan Patrick and Rich Eisen and Robin Roberts and Charlie Steiner and Bob Lee, all these people, the personalities came out, Chris Berman, everybody, and they were just, they became celebrities. The only problem that happened to Sports Center is uh, <laughs> killed it. Killed it. I mean, it's not dead. Go but in here's what, the problem. In what, 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 what is, what is in the heyday of Sports Center? Keith Overman and Dan Patrick used to say, "Okay, when we come back after commercial, we're going to tell you who won the Mets and the and the uh, you know the Yankees and the Red Sox game." I have to wait till commercial. I have to wait till <laughs> eleven o'clock. I'm getting every single inning. I can watch the thing on my phone. Like, where's the value proposition for waiting till eleven o'clock at night? And so, part of what ESPN has gone through over the past decade is coming to grips with technology. The fact that I don't, I, I literally, for all my favorite teams, I get all my highlights here, I get all my scores updated every single, like in baseball, I get, even if I'm not watching it, I get a little bell that goes off and tells me the, the score after every inning. I, I don't need it. So they've tried to change the model of SportsCenter now, and it's more about analysis and more about you know, analytics and all that stuff. But this was, this was very detrimental to ESPN. Right. Uh, um, just to piggyback on that with SportsCenter, you mentioned Keith Overman, Dan Patrick, uh, et cetera. Um, and yet it seemed like the more successful these guys got, excuse me, but these guys got, um, there was an inherent tension there with, with the parents, the parent company. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering if you can address that and, and it speaks to some of maybe what's happening and some of the issues they're having for the future, which is to say, um, are, are they as, a, as ESPN as a company, do they have problems with somebody getting too big? Yeah, so um, the old adage, when the Lord wants to punish you, he answers your prayers. You know, so they're picking these people and they're hoping they become stars. What happens when somebody becomes a star? Like movies or television or whatever? Well, two things. One is, first of all, they want more money. So if you're an executive, that's, that's gonna make you car sick. <laughs> and the second thing is, they want more power. They want more say in things. It's like, I don't like this, I don't like that. 
I don't think we should do this anymore. It's like, you know, when Tom Cruise walks onto a movie set, everything at that movie on that movie set is basically the way Tom Cruise wants it because that's what power means. Um, so one of the things that happened is that in the 1990s, they started to develop these personalities and they started, and management started to get a little worried about it. And so there was this tension. And about 10 years ago, actually, ESPN went through a period where there were no personalities. I mean, no offense to some of the sports center anchors, but it wasn't like they weren't cultivating names. They were very interchangeable. And then what happened was, well, then why are people, people thought to themselves, well, why aren't we watching? You know, now they want to watch because it's like watching Jimmy Kimmel or watching Jimmy Fallon or something. So that's the, now they're gone back the other way. They're trying to make stars out of these people, so you want to spend time with them. So it's been like this, remember that old game, Shoots and Ladders? You know, you kind of like take three steps and, oh, this is good, and then you go up, or, uh-oh, this is bad, and you fall down to the bottom. And so a lot of what's been going on at ESPN over the past decade has been like an EKG. It's like, you know, oh, this is great, uh-oh, uh-oh, this is great. And it's riding that out, and it's, um, it's tough because uh, – there's no secret sauce that you know somebody has the recipe to. You've got to try things out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you mentioned how ESPN has had its various incarnations in terms of like, investors slash owners from um, Getty Oil, which uh, didn't seem as complimentary as maybe you others. You want me to tell you the Getty story for a second? Uh, it's a great story, yes, of course. The guy <laughs> just died. His name was Stu Evie. Um, he's working for Getty in the 70s. This is when J. Paul Getty was the richest man in, not only in the country, in the world. And uh, he had a son who was troubled. And um, the son one night in his mansion got drunk, was yelling and screaming at his wife, locked himself in the bathroom. And this guy, his name was Stu Evie. He just died. This guy is called over to the house. And he's J. Paul Getty's guy. And um, he tries to reason with the son. Son st stabbing himself with a fork inside the bathroom. Finally, Stu breaks the door down. They get in. He's bleeding. There's blood on the floor. There's a hospital like a quarter mile away. He doesn't take it to that hospital. He doesn't take the guy to the hospital. He takes it to a hospital far away because at that hospital, the press was around that hospital. And the press monitored that hospital and everything. He wanted to keep it quiet. So he takes him to a hospital far away. And lo and behold, the guy dies. First of all, he called J. Paul Getty after his son had died and just said, listen, just want to give you an update. I'm at the hospital. Your son is in the hospital, but... We don't know how it's going to be, but it, you know, just hang on. So I said to him, by the way, so you lied to J. Paul Getty? You go, well, I didn't want to tell him all the bad news all at once. It's like, okay. <laughs> but it turns out that because he kept it quiet and because he kept the press out of it and kind of covered up some other things about that night, which I am not at liberty to share, but let's just say they were quite toasty, um, J. Paul Getty basically rewarded this guy, and he became in charge of everything in the J. Paul Getty empire that didn't have anything to do with oil. And what does that mean? It turns out they owned hotels. They were the largest owner of almonds, trees, almond farms in the world. They were all these things. So this guy, I mean, he turns into like one of the most powerful people in California. And his thing was... He loved to golf, and he also loved athletes. He loved hanging out with athletes. He would have athletes come down to his hotels. You know, by the way, he had a thing where he would, they would call ahead. His driver would call ahead to one of the hotels that they owned, like an Acapulco or something. And as the car was pulling in, <laughs> he would have bands play his favorite song upon his arrival. And this guy, <laughs> this guy was so... He was this jock-loving guy, and when he heard this idea for ESPN, he's like, yeah, I'll, 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 you know, I'll, here, here's some money. And uh, by the way, 
wound up firing Bill Rasmussen, whose idea it was, and his son. Kicked them both out. But Because um, that's what people do in the business, right? But I got to tell you something. <laughs> Bill said to me, "There's they had gone with this idea for ESPN to everybody in the entire world, and no one said yes to them. I mean, they got one round of funding from this small little venture capital group, but that was it. They went through that. If it wasn't for Stu Evie, there would be no ESPN. Yeah. So once again, it's like, wait, the good news or the bad news? <laughs> the good news is there's a guy named Stu Evie that's going to give you money. The bad news is he actually got in control of all that money because of this sordid thing with J. Paul Getty's son, but let's not think about that for a second. And then he's going to give you this money, but P.S., he's going to fire you after a year and a half. You're not going to be there. Can you imagine? By the way, Bill Rasmussen is still alive. Right. Can you imagine what it's like to come up with the idea, get the satellite, buy the property in Bristol? I mean, it's like I've said to him many times. It's like carrying a baby around for nine months. You, you know, you give birth to it, and then somebody takes it away. Like he and his son, the night that they first went on the air, were like crying because the dream came true. Like he had never done anything like that and Stu fired him. Well, now, present day, uh, Disney owns what, 80% and Hearst owns 20? 20. Is that still, that's still the ratio. So uh, let's talk about then, uh, primarily with Disney um, and being a public company, et cetera. How is that relationship, how has that evolved? And when we talk about today and then to the future of ESPN, you know, I'm a, let's say I'm a shareholder. Um, am I looking at ESPN as high value or am I looking at it as, wow, those rights fees for the NFL are going through the roof. I don't want to pay X billion uh, with, with my public money. Yeah, so it's quite the story, right? Um, you know Disney owns Pixar, right? They bought Pixar, Steve Jobs company, the animation company. Um, they bought it with money that ESPN made. ESPN delivered a ton of money to Disney. I alluded to that before. And for a while there, not to get too mathematical, but every single year ESPN was getting 20% compounded growth on their, on their cable bills. I mean, just think about the money. It was, it's, just, it's enough to make you a Bolshevik. I mean, it's like <laughs> so much money that they were giving to Disney. And as a result, Disney was kind of like, we like this, we like this. And then all of a sudden, it started to slow down. And also, as you alluded to, they were starting to, they had to pay, their contract with the NFL for Monday Night Football was $15.3 billion. They spend $2 billion a year on 16 football games. So all of a sudden, you know, the profits weren't as big. And what did Disney say? That's okay, thanks so much. No, they said it like, remember in Goodfellas, where the guy says, F you, pay me, F you, pay me? That's what Disney was like. Come on, come on, let's figure out a way to pay me. So that's why they had to lay off people, stop doing some of the things they did. Um, Look, at this point, if you're a Disney shareholder, let's not feel sorry for ESPN. It still makes a lot of money. It's still very re relevant. It's got no competition in terms of there's nobody else that can do what ESPN can do. It has competition in certain areas, but there's no other company the size of ESPN. But they still have a lot of struggles behind. And I think that the bottom line for me at least is you're never going to see the kind of growth from ESPN again that we saw from 1988 to 2010. Never gonna happen again. Right. But it can still be successful. Right, and I appreciate you walking us through and I always, always talk about with sports, you know, there's sports and what happens on the field but it's such a bigger story always, culturally, uh, television-wise, business and it's a business story at, at the end of the day. And going into that a little bit deeper, now that we're sort of present day, this is the reality here, um, let's talk about what's been, what ESPN is facing. So we talked about cord cutting with the younger generation. Uh, we talked about, uh, so that means cables less, uh, viewers. 
uh, football is going through its own crisis with uh, declining ratings, concussion, um, what that situation. You've got the ESPN president, you know, a rainmaker who resigns totally out of the blue after just signing a contract extension for substance addiction. Um, you've got the president tweeting to one of the anchors uh, of, of Sports Center, who is supposedly the new generation face. So, in terms of unpacking all of that baggage, um, you know, I, I'm an ESPN employee. Am I am I worried that there's going to be that many more layoffs coming up? Question mark. I think they are worried, but I mean, look, you did an excellent job of of talking about some of the conundrums facing them. I mean, the Trump thing was really interesting because not to get into politics, but here's the thing: there's always been kind of a separation between politics and sports. Not always. In 1968, the Olympics, there was a big hiccup, and Jesse Owens in 1936, you know, uh, competing in front of Adolf Hitler. There was uh, some geopolitical stuff there, but basically it's been hard. Here's the problem. When you have Colin Kaepernick kneeling on football games, and you have other teams participating, all of a sudden, politics starts to bleed in, right? And when ESPN at the RSPs gives the Courage Award, Arthur Ashe Courage Award, to Caitlyn Jenner, all of a sudden, people start to say, well, ESPN's like a liberal place. And ESPN saying, no, we're not liberal. We just gave it to her because we thought she was courageous. And we're talking about Colin Kaepernick because it's relevant to what's going on in the NFL. But then Jamel Hill, who's uh, one of the Sports Center anchors, went after Trump and. Uh, on, on social media, on, on Twitter, that sort of thing. I mean, she kind of, you know, called him a white supremacist. Other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, how was the play? <laughs> um, and uh, so then all of a sudden, the White House briefing room, you got to fire her. ESPN's too political. So after, with all these other financial things that are going on, now they got the whole thing where, like sometimes I give speeches and people will say during the Q&A, why is ESPN such a liberal institution? Why do they hate Trump? Why, are they, why did they decide to become so political? And in ESPN's mind, they're not political at all, but that's the perception. So that's yet another hurdle that they've had to jump over. Um, to, to address uh, what had happened with, with Skipper, Resigning, and this is John Skipper, one of the uh, most the president of ESPN, most powerful uh, figures in sports. However, you want to dice and slice that, um, and resigns abruptly after just addressing uh, the troops, so to speak. And I know you wrote a column on that, and I'm I'm just wondering how that plays in. What is the successor looking like, and does that change the path of ESPN, whether it's the philosophy of 30 for 30 and those documentaries or how to look at SportsCenter, that sort of thing? So, uh, let's see. On a Wednesday in December, John Skipper called the talent from all over the country to come in and addressed all the employees. Part of it was about social media. <coughs> Watch what you say on Twitter because whether you realize it or not, you're a public figure and we're gonna hold you accountable. Part of it was trying to assuage fears about the future, talking about we do have a plan, we do have a strategy. And he said, you know, I believe in this, I believe in all of us, we're gonna get through this together. That was Wednesday. That Monday, Monday morning, and he sent a memo to every ESPN employee saying he was resigning because of a substance abuse issue. John Skipper is 62. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever heard him talk. He's got a master's in literature from Columbia. He's like a really smart, lovely guy. Um, it turns out that he did have an issue. I wrote a column which, you know, was a little disruptive because um, I said I didn't believe that he uh, he resigned. 
because um, I believe he was pushed out. Basically, I said he he didn't jump; he was pushed. And um, what I believe happened was that Disney wanted to make a change, but because Skipper was so popular, they couldn't fire him. Because if you fire a popular president, two things happen, right? All the employees grab pitchforks because they're mad, right? They're they how dare you do this? The second thing is whoever replaces that person has like a bullseye the size of Texas on their back because it's like, oh, you're the one who came in and took away our beloved leader. So I think it was kind of a Machiavellian ploy to have Skipper admit his substance abuse problem and say he had to go around and fix it. I mean, look, I think you go to treatment facilities around the country, they're full of executives. Pe people basically say, hey, you know what? I got a problem, give me 30 days, 60 days, 90 days or whatever, I'm gonna try and conquer it and I'll be back. And most companies say okay. Because if, you know, if you, if you support somebody and you believe in them, that's what you want them to do. You want them to get better. And we all love a success story and, you know, that's great when somebody triumphs over that. So I did not buy it for one second and I was really pleased after the article came out that so many people said, ah, felt the same way, or I, you know what, come to think of it, I agree with you. Um, so a lot of people were pleased about it. Uh, for some reason, Disney was not pleased <laughs> about that comment. I don't, can't get it. Wh where do you think that came from within Disney? I mean, does that go all the way up to Iger? I mean, how, how does that? Uh, yeah, a decision like that, yeah. I mean, look, Bob Iger is the most successful, the best media executive of the last quarter century. No offense to anybody else. I don't even know who's second. He's so successful. What he's done with Disney is phenomenal, and the kind of leader he is, it's just extraordinary. So, um, but n you don't you don't get rid of the ESPN president unless Bob Iger's involved. Um, to use a sports metaphor, how's their bench to replace him? I know they have what B Bodenheimer is. Um, is oh, a guy named George Bodenheimer, who Bodenheimer. was president before Skipper. Um, is babysitting for 90 days while they find somebody. But yeah. I think um, you'll appreciate this coming from Bristol. I think this is going to be the first time since 1980 when the new president hasn't come in from the ESPN employee ranks. And the only reason I mention that is because Bristol's unusual. And by the way, the ESPN campus, it's not a building. It's like it's like a small city. And just to, it's gonna take somebody six months to find out and figure out where the bathrooms are. I mean, it's a big company with a very unique culture. And so I think that it's, uh, it's a very, very provocative, strange time for ESPN right now. Um, the people that I talk to every day from there, it's a lot of uncertainty. And uh, I guess, you know, you think back on one of Freud's definitions of maturity is the ability to handle ambiguity. And so I tell my friends that all the time. I go, look, you gotta hang in there. I know it's ambiguous, but you gotta see it through. And, uh, but it's tough. It's really hard for people and their families. There's a lot of, there's just, the future is very, very muddled right now. Um, you, you, you talked about other deals that have happened. Obviously a very recent one with Disney agreeing to buy 21st Century Fox. How does that change the dynamic, or does it? Because um, I know the sp some of the sports, the sports properties were not involved in the, in the sale. Well, something. not to get too deep in the weeds, yeah. but the RSNs were the oh, regional yeah. sports networks. But yeah. Um, yeah, so Homer Simpson, The Simpsons, right? It's now part of Disney. Disney bought a big chunk of Fox Studios. And um, it's made ESPN bigger because of these local regional sports networks. So as a result, it's a much bigger, I mean, it was big before, now it's much bigger. And uh, so the person who comes in and takes that job uh, has, a, has a, I mean, it's, it's wide open. There are so many choices to make. There's so many decisions. And I believe that the next three years of ESPN's future will determine its next decade. That's how pivotal a time we're facing, or they're facing. And certainly we've always, with sports media and sports television per se, there's always been this sort of apocalyptic 
uh, wing, uh, oh my gosh, the, you know, let's say bidding for the Olympic Games gets exponentially higher, but people always do pay. Um, what is still the attraction of live sports um, and will that carry ESPN into the future, whether it's SEC football or NBA basketball? You know, what are the key properties to, to keep an eye on? Well, here's the key, really, right? Um, what's a show that everybody watches right now? Like The Voice, right? Or something? <laughs> so it's, it's, pick a show, pick a show. What is it? The Crown, right. The Crown's on right now. It's a great <laughs> show, by the way, right? Five years from now, I'm not sure if The Crown's going to be on. Five years from now, I know The Rose Bowl's going to be on. So there's something about live sports that you know that there's going to be, there's a certainty to it. Because we all, I mean, even with the decrease in NFL ratings, uh, next week, the Super Bowl, the ads for the Super Bowl, NBC, it's going to be record number of ads and income. It's going to be phenomenal. So when you talk about rights, particularly college football, People love college football, yeah. and ESPN has spent, I think, over $25 billion, $25 billion, locking up these, like, 10 years, 12 years, right? Because it's, we know the games are going to happen. And if you got the games, that's really helpful. So I think that, you know, part of it is, I mean, look, the NFL is a little different because, I'll just digress for one second. I sent out, I went out to, uh, I was going to write this piece for the New York Times, went out to Pittsburgh and I heard that there was this 12 year old phenomenon. By the time I got there, he was 13. <laughs> um, but he, uh, he was a quarterback and I saw him, he's six feet one, I'm standing on the sidelines, he's six one and he throws the ball like 40 yards, a perfect spiral. I, I mean, the, the kid is just amazing. And I'm talking to the coach, and the coach said, I got to tell you, Jim, keep your eye on this, cause, this kid, because he's going to be starting quarterback for Notre Dame, Michigan, Alabama, you name it. And then he's going to be like Peyton Manning. He's going to be like Tom Brady. I mean, he's got it all. Look at him. I mean, like 13 years old, six, I mean, like, unbelievable. So I had that conversation with the coach, and then I decided I wanted to go meet the kid's parents. Because, you know, you got so much such unbelievable future ahead of you, right? I mean, it'll be interesting to see how they're going to manage it. And I introduced myself, and the father said, huh, it's so great that you're here for his last game. I go, what? He goes, oh, yeah, this is his last football game. I said, what, what do you mean? I, I have no idea. What do you I said, I was just talking to the Oh, yeah, we haven't told the coach yet. <laughs> well, what's going on? He goes, well, um, he's, he can be a starting pitcher, or he can be a power forward in basketball but we're not going to let our son get brain damaged. And I stood there at that moment, I thought to myself, whew, if you're Roger Goodell and you're commissioner of the NFL, that's a pretty big story for you because there is no doubt, there is no doubt about what happens to these players' brains. They had a 27-year-old, I think it was, who died. They did an autopsy. The CTE, which is the traumatic brain, was pervasive at 27. I, I mean, it is so heartbreaking to see these uh, athletes who are in their 50s. First of all, they can't walk because their knees are shot. I mean, nowadays, if you want to be an offensive lineman in college, you have to be over 300 pounds. 325 pounds. And then you, if you're good enough, then you play for like average life, play six years maybe, seven years. So let's say you're 29 and you retire from football and you're 345 pounds. Except now, after playing for the last 10 years, your knees are so banged up that you can't walk. So now, so you can't exercise and you're used to eating 4,000 or 5,000 calories a day, <laughs> and now also you're taking OxyContin and all these painkillers for your pain, plus you have traumatic brain injury, it is unbelievable. I mean, 
it, it is, I've met some of these NFL vets, and not to turn this into a diatribe about the NFL, but it's a violent sport. And so what's happening is, you know, the future of the NFL. We have to talk about that because what, what happens when these parents start saying, not my kid? Right. Um, right. It's really... Yeah, well, that's your that's, that's, that's his story. 12, that's, that's his story, old. high school football. It's not like, by the way, it's not even like the parents are saying, well, we're going to let him play college because he's going to get a full scholarship, so then we don't have to pay for college, and then he's not gonna, we're not going to let him play pro. They're stopping him at 13 because guess what? You think that those players in college aren't getting hit hard? I mean, you know, well, so this is this – is yeah, Well, this, your, your story of the uh, high school quarterback phenom changed. I mean, it's a different story now. It's this is possibly a future uh, for sport and for great athletes who might have chosen football ten years ago. Let's say. I mean, it's great news for baseball and basketball. Sure, or <laughs> others. Yeah, well, let's. We have a few minutes, so would gladly like to hear from the audience. Yeah, I mean, look, that's a side of the business that's really kind of fun, right? I mean, John Gruden, who used to be in the Monday Night Football, he just signed a $100 million deal to coach the Oakland Raiders, and now they're trying to figure out who to replace him. Um, NBC just announced yesterday that Bob Costas is not going to be doing the Super Bowl this year because he's been going around talking about how he thinks football is a dangerous sport mm. and it's painful to watch, and mm. he's worried about the players' health, so... He's not going to be doing the foot, the Super Bowl. Um, the there are different levels. John Gruden got six point two million dollars a year, and some. That's sixteen specials. Mondays. <laughs> I mean, look, he did some and other shows. He did some other shows and whatever, but you yeah. know, um, he watched a lot of film. Rich or poor, it's good to have money. I mean, that's a pretty good salary. Uh, Look, some of them, you know, I mean, it, you, if you get to that stage, you're getting a lot of money. Um, Tony Romo, who was quarterback for the Dallas Cowboys, he is, he is phenomenal. Yeah. By the way, I, there was a game, I guess, week 14. It was not the greatest game. By the way, that's another problem the NFL has. Big time. When we were growing up, Big time. every single team had four stars, three or yeah. four stars that you knew. Now – it's ridiculous. There's, there's not enough stars to go around. But there was a, it was a pretty weak game. But you know what? I wound up watching a lot of it just because Tony Romo was calling it, and it was so entertaining. And he's, he's teaching you wa watching the field. He is. He's fantastic. Peyton Manning may be joining the booth. Um, may be joining the booth. What, what do you make of replay and how that has disrupted the rhythm of – watching football on Sunday and, and extended you know, it. It's cost-benefit because, uh, look, there used to be some bad calls that would take away a championship or take away a victory, an important victory. And now at least, you know, I mean, it's a pain in the neck, but at least you know the calls are going to be right. Right. Uh, sir, did you have a question? Yeah. What do you do to Chris Thurman? Uh, Chris is semi-retired. He... Uh, he was on last Sunday, actually, for the first time this season. Um, by the way, the, a couple months after he semi-retired, he lost his wife in an awful car crash. Just so sad. They had just built a beautiful home in Hawaii. 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 Just the saddest thing in the world. Um, I'm not sure. But, um, you know, I think he's adjusting to semi-retirement. He's not enjoying it. Um, and uh, <laughs> I think they're going to try and find ways for him to fit in every once in a while. For many, many years, Chris Berman was the highest paid employee of ESPN. Oh, I mean, there were years when he was making over $5 million a year when $5 million was real money. And that was back how many years ago? Five, ten years ago? Five years, yeah. Okay, so now at least six, six, 16 Mondays, he's got to eat. <laughs> <laughs> 
So we can have a fundraiser for him afterwards. <laughs> did, did you have a question, sir? Well, sometimes on the web, you know, they have like uh, ESPN3, which is all their streaming stuff. So they don't have to spend so much money on anchors and commentators. They can have younger people who just want a chance at that. So they bring them in there to channel something. Quick, quickly, let's, because we don't have a lot of people here, so maybe we can go a little bit over because we don't have crowd control issues. So maybe we can do real quick. I mean, they try. I mean, NBC does it with English Premier League, you know, on early Saturday mornings. The problem is that ESPN, you can't compete. They have 8,760 hours a year to, to fill. Yeah. So they can put it on whenever they want. By the way, they also have ESPN. They have ESPN2. They have ESPN Classic. They have, I mean, so it's crazy. NBC uses it with the Olympics, of course. Right. So, and yeah, quick. It's part of the equation. First of all, they, I mean. Capital cities. That cap, cap cities owned it. But uh, yeah, it, in Bristol, there was no union. So it was a lot cheaper um, to keep it there. And the, and the kids didn't mind doing a little OT. They, so, you know. Oh, no <laughs> rules. No rules. Yes. Yeah, and the question is about why are why is the NFL suffering popularity right now? Um, people are worried about the injuries. There's not enough good teams around. They started, they're greedy. They started Thursday night football. So the schedule stinks. There's not enough good matchups around.